We're going to turn this over now to Brian and Ryan and get started. Go ahead, Brian. Thanks, Amy. Good day, everybody. Thanks for joining us on the uh, Health Systems webinar today. We'll be talking uh, uh, just a reimbursement update, um, particularly into Medicare um, and the PPS side, maybe just a little bit on uh, CH and how those could be affected, but mostly on the PPS hospitals uh, side of things. I'm Brian Birch. I'm a principal out of the Sioux Falls, South Dakota office. I've been with Ide Bailey um, seems like yesterday, but a little, uh, a little more than 23 years now. And, uh, and so thanks for joining us. I spend pretty much all of my time uh, in the reimbursement sector for uh, hospitals and health systems. Uh, joining me today is Ryan Ashland. Um, he does not have a picture uh, yet. I noticed that, so we got to fix that. But uh, I'll let uh, Ryan take over and introduce himself and do the first part of the presentation. All right. Thanks, everybody. Happy Friday. I'm going to actually turn my video off because it just kicked me off a minute ago, and I don't want to have interference on that, so I'm not sure what was going on. But I've been with Hyde Bailey for a couple months now. Um, previous to that, I was working at a health system in Minnesota for a number of years, had a variety of finance roles, including some overseeing some reimbursement items, and that's what we're going to talk about mainly today. Get to the next slide here. There we go. So it's kind of like an executive summary. We're going to talk about some key provisions of some recent reimbursement updates. The inpatient outpatient proposals rules are two of the main topics. Hopefully what we're kind of our goal is today is provide you with some relevant background information that you're looking for. Not get into a lot of the number de um, details of the, this base rate change 3,500 to 3,550 or something like that, but hopefully give you enough background information so that you can say, does this area impact my organization? What is relevance to me? And then what next steps do I need to take most importantly with that? Then when we get done, we'll hopefully let the email out all the slides to everyone so you can have them as a reference as we go forward as well. In terms of a specific agenda, we're gonna start off talking about the inpatient proposed rule. We had hoped the final rule would have been out by now, but unfortunately that's not yet available. Been delayed with a lot of other things this year, understandably so. We're gonna talk a little bit in there. You can see the agenda items. We'll hit on the wage index, talking about some of the detail reporting that we're gonna need for uncompensated care, bad debts, and some payment information. I'll go through that most of that section, and Brian's going to go through the OPPS proposed rule as well. And we'll talk about off-site provider-based clinics, productivity standards, and everyone's favorite topic of provider relief funds. So with that, we're just going to dive right into the IPPS proposed rule, their inpatient prospective payment system. And we're going to start off with the payment changes. There's hundreds of pages in this proposed rule, and when Medicare kind of put all the numbers together, they had calculated that overall payment PPS hospitals was going to go up about 1.6%. So positive that it's going up, probably similar increases to what we've seen in prior years. A few of the key components of that you can see there, the big one is the base operating rate increase of 3.1%. So that's a healthy increase for everybody, probably a little more than we've seen in the past couple of years. But there are changes that are then reducing that down. We've listed a couple of them here, including the disproportionate share and some of those outlier and various other components. Some of the ones we've listed is going down, probably impact some of our larger urban facilities more than maybe some of the smaller rural facilities. So when we're looking through the rule, some of the increases for rural facilities are oftentimes a little bit better than some of the larger urban facilities. So once we get the, whole, the final rule out, hopefully within the next couple of days, we'll, you'll be able to increase, to calculate what's your specific facility increase. And you, a lot of hospital associations help with that and so forth. And there's a lot of other factors that go into each particular facility. You can come up and your payment might be a little bit more than the 1.6% increase, but you can get to that calculation in detail at that point. So kind of wrapping that up, small payment increase, probably similar to prior years. Next, we're gonna transition in talking about wage index, and there's a few other provisions we'll get into a, a little more detail there. 
And one of the items at the top of the list for most people is they've seen some of these counties being shifted between urban and rural status. The OMB did some work to try to differentiate counties between rural status that they have now or urban status and should that be changed. So CMS has picked up on that. So they're gonna be shifting some counties between those areas. So there's hospitals in those counties that are gonna be impacted that they used to be rural and now are gonna be urban or vice versa. Specifically, that can impact obviously your wage index and DISH as two particular items to pay attention to. And then if the facilities have been negative increased, Medicare has proposed in the rule to say there's gonna be a three-year transition plan. So it really won't come off as a cliff of going from X to Y all in one year. A couple of factors to think about as you're looking at these facilities, we'll go through the counties in a moment. If I'm a PPS facility and I'm moving between one county or one status of urban to rural or vice versa, could I file, file a geographic reclass that I haven't had to file in the past? That might be able to way to get back into that urban status that you might be losing. It, the Medicare geographic reclasses are often due right away in September. Those actually have been delayed as well due to the final rule being delayed. So there's a regulation that Medicare set out there that said those are gonna be due 15 days after the final rule is released. So there's not a lot of time between the final rule and that. So we might wanna do a little bit of looking if you're impacted by this at the current time. Ryan, yep. I just, uh, just wanted to say in regards to the final rule, I kind of expect that to be out either later today when we when we had this webinar I was hoping we were fully hoping that the final rule would be out by now but um, I wouldn't fully anticipate it to be out probably either later today tonight um, or over the weekend would be my thoughts the reason for that is um, CMS did put in there a 30-day notice so because it has to be effective 10-1 um, it's got to be out any day now, so I would fully expect that to be out soon. So the geographic reclasses, you're probably looking at that deadline date of mid-September. Sounds good. And one other provision related to these counties moving, if you have a call on your uh, system that's moving between rural and urban, they need to be able to, uh, moving from rural to urban, excuse me, they need to be able to file a reclass to say they want to be able to still be considered rural. There's not as much of a pending deadline on that one, but it's one other thing we got to make sure that you check the box on. We've got the counties listed here. We're not going to go through each one of them. You can look at the states and see if there's a, a facility impacted for your organization. These are the facilities moving from urban to rural. So there's quite a list there. Not a ton of facilities impacted, but there are a number here. And then there's also a list of, of facilities that are going from rural to urban as well. And there's two pages here, we'll go through these. My favorite joke on this one is the third one from the bottom, the Lake County in Minnesota, that's on Duluth. It's a large county, it's north and east of Duluth for those who are unfamiliar with it. And it goes all the way up into Canada. And it includes the boundary waters. So you can be in the boundary waters canoe area where you can't have anything that's motorized or, or electronic and so forth. And you're going to be in an urban county according to CMS designations, which right or wrong, it is what it is. So counties may not be the perfect dividing. That's the rules we have to go by. And then here's the second page of those counties that are going from rural to urban. So that kind of wraps up kind of the, di the discussion about the county changes. There's a couple other changes we want to go on wage and most of these are going to be beneficial. Medicare is proposing to continue with their hospital policy. This is probably something that's going to continue over several years. What they're trying to do is how can they help the facilities that are on the low end of the wage index get their wage rates up by giving them a little more money hopefully to be able to convert to the staff increases. And remember the wage index is always a couple of years behind. So it takes a few years for this to catch up. So hospitals below the 25th percentile will be seeing an increase because of this provision. Another one that's beneficial for some of the rural they're in an urban area um, that wage 
your state rural area, which is probably going to happen in some of the larger metro areas, they will be able to get a that they won't go below that rural area in that state. So if mine was 0.9 and the rural area is one, I would get the one. Two other ones relating to wage index, there's the frontier state hospital floor. There's to the, the states that have impact facilities. There's a couple other states included that, but they didn't have any facilities that will impact it, those facilities index floor of 1.0. So that's a positive for those facilities as well. And the last particular one on this one is they, they, Medicare saying they don't want any facilities to have their wage index go down by more than 5%. So hopefully not a lot of people would experience that, but if it did occur, they're gonna cap that decrease. So, so there's a couple real um, positive impacts related to the wage index on those last couple points. And, kind of try to summarize these up in key points. I always remind everyone and myself included that the wage index is important. It's a material part of your reimbursement. So when we're doing the cost report or you're helping prepare it, we want to focus on the settlement and make sure we're getting the proper reimbursement there, but making sure we're also the wage index provisions correctly. And then to do that, I always make sure we spend time on that. The, the last couple points about where spend the time in particular this year is well we've are you moving staff around because of the public health emergency are people doing different jobs have you had furloughs those types of things are we recording all of the dollars and hours for them in the appropriate departments i'm going to categorize them on the wage index correctly those types of things and also remember there's also the occupational mixes that get impacted by this as well so so pay attention to it. It's a material part of it. Don't lose sight of it as you keep going forward. That's kind of the wage index summary. Next, we're going to move on to a little more of some detail on a couple particular items, starting with your DISH and your uncompensated care. So DISH is your disproportionate share. Medicare is proposing to use a similar process to pay people for uncompensated care. They have a, currently have a three-step process where they kind of figure out, here's the dollars, do some calculations, and say, okay, here's what we're gonna pay everybody. And then what's your particular piece of that pot of money? And to figure out what your particular piece is, they're proposing to use a single year of data from the, the S10 worksheet. As a reminder, the S10 worksheet is a cost report worksheet we have to fill out every year where you have to list out your Medicaid revenue, how much you lost on Medicaid services, but also your charity care and bad debt information. And Medicare is proposing to use the 2017 information when they do this work. So there's still a couple years in arrears and they keep when they um, kept doing this calculation. And some of you have probably experienced these S10 audits related to that information, and they're getting into very much into the details of your patient listing. And these audits are probably going to increase. The first one is a quote you can see that talking about people having $20 million difference between audited and unaudited data. That's quite a bit. So the conclusion is then the second quote, they're finding these discrepancies in the audit. So they're doing a lot of these audits now. And they're gonna expect them to increase in the future years. So if you've been audited, you know what we're talking about. If you haven't, probably thank your stars at this point, but you're probably going to be audited in the future. In the audit, they're gonna dive into the details of what's going on with your listing, wanting to test some particular patients and things. The hard part is we found a lot of inconsistent audit approaches and findings when talking with facility. One organization put a comment out there in regards to this proposed rule is they had two hospitals in their health system being audited on S10. Both of them had the same intermediary and different auditors, but same intermediary. And one auditor made one recommendation and another auditor made the exact opposite recommendation regarding one part of the data. So I think it's everyone struggling a little bit with this just to make sure they understand the clear guidance and things. So it's gonna present some challenges. So how do we help overcome those challenges is really make sure we're preparing those detail lists that you're submitting with your cost report. Making sure I've got those are, lists are technical revenue, they're related to the hospital organization, they're not my professional revenue, 
and they're not just to my general ledger amounts that I'm putting on the cost report. Make sure I've got that list, I've got it submitted with my cost report and things. I think that'll go a long way to making sure we're comfortable and the audits will go smoother in the future. The one thing to think about as we go to kind of try to wrap up this section is we can start preparing those information now to submit with the report we're doing, but they're gonna be doing audits of 2017, 18, 19, 20, and maybe we're submitting 20 data now. So there might be a couple of years that maybe I should work and try to detail list now. So I'm more prepared. I have that paper trail. But it does come two years after that words I've got the information pulled together. So key point out of there's a lot of details here, but hopefully we can be prepared for them and better address the audits that are more than likely going to continue as we go forward. So that kind of wraps up that section. That now, so a little bit more on price and payment transparency. It's, so we have two sections to talk about here. The first one we're going to talk about is the requirement effective January 1st of this year to be posting some information out there related to charges and prices. These are the five specific components that we're needing to post there. And then, as you know, this ruling or request has gone under quite a bit of um, contention, comments, litigation, and so forth. But as of this point, it's approved to go forward. So I'm going to go on in the next couple slides, try to walk through those five components in a little bit more in playing languages. What do they mean to me? So I start with the first one, the standard gross charge. Okay, the charge master. That's probably the easy one, the list of your prices. A lot of you are already posting that today. So that's probably the easy one to check off the box. The next one's a little bit harder. Your negotiated payer specific charges or rates. And I say that's what you're getting paid. So if we peel back the covers a little bit on what we need here, we don't have to do this for traditional Medicare and Medicaid but I will have to do it for my other payers. And those other payers include my Medicare Advantage and my managed Medicaid plans. So I'm gonna have to get those by all of my payers, put them out there, keeping in mind I could be paid on DRG and one percent of charge in another contract to per diem. So there's lots of variation out there that I'm gonna have to put into a a summary format and be able to describe that information. So there's work to be had here to get this information. It's really the guts of the requirement in my opinion. Then there's three other components, your cash discounted price. I call that your uninsured discount. So if you have a charge of hundred bucks and you're giving a 10, 20 or 30% uninsured discount, that's how you would portray that information. And the last two, they talk about your maximum and minimum charge. So I really talk about, okay, these are my maximum and minimum payment rates. And in theory, if I've listed all of my payment rates from plans earlier, they should be able to see what the maximum and minimum is there, but they're really trying to call that out separately in this section. So those are really piggybacking off of that number two section we went through earlier. So that's a lot of information we're gonna to have to get out there, but of course there's more details behind there to go through. So we're gonna to have to keep this updated. You know, it's gonna to have to be updated every year, more than likely. I have to make sure people can get at it. I have to, it's machine readable. I can go to your website, easily find it. I don't have to register for it, those types of things. So it's gonna to have to be out there somewhat easily for people to be able to see. And then we're also going to have to make sure and we call out the shoppable items. So those shoppable items, shoppable, excuse me, are 300 items that CMS has mandated 70 of them. So there's an additional 230 the organization has to put out there. And there can be maybe a little interpretation of how I get at those, but just keep in mind the more complex the procedures I put out there, there's probably a little bit more difficulty in obtaining a uh, reasonable amount. So use your judgment as to what the most important ones and the most common ones for you are. And some organizations may have that price estimator tool, which is great, and then that would satisfy that requirement if you have that going. So last point on this section, keep in mind this deadline's four months away. If you haven't gotten started on yet, probably need to start um, laying out your plan to be able to put that out there. 
So this is the CMS or the federal regulations. You could have state regulations that are that you need to require with as well. So just don't lose sight of those. And then try to maybe when you're putting through all the data, what, what feedback am I gonna get from this data? So is there something I can do to proactively manage the information that I'm putting out there? If I have four Medicare Advantage plans that pay me Medicare plus 3%, and I have one that pays me Medicare plus 5%, well, the one that pays me Medicare plus five is probably going to know that. So how can I proactively understand the other components of the contract to say, why do I get paid that higher amount? Or do I think my prices that I'm and payments that I'm putting out there are reasonable? Probably don't want to be the highest, don't want to be the lowest. So how do you just kind of help do a little reasonableness check on those more than anything as need be? So there's a lot there in the payment or price transparency. Unfortunately, it's not the only requirement in this section. There's also a new cost report requirement that we're gonna have to comply with related to the payment transparency. And so this is coming out in the proposed rules and what they're really trying to say is how can they obtain more market-based payment rates? So this is gonna be for cost report periods ending on or after 1121. So not your current cost reports that are ending this year, but we're going to be ending after 11. And so what Medicare is trying to do is say, okay, can I get my more market-based payment rates? Can I use those to help calculate what I should be paying organizations in the future? You can argue if that's going to be a valid approach or not, but this is the plan they're going at the moment. So a little bit of specifics about what they're looking for there is really two columns of data by DRG. The first one is what's the medic median negotiated charge for my Medicare Advantage plans. And the second one is what's my median negotiated charge for all plans, including Medicare Advantage. When they say charge, they're meaning payment rate. So I can, I can see a list of here's all the DRGs and here's your Medicare Advantage column and here's your everything column. And this is gonna be a new worksheet S12 on the cost report to put that information out there. So this is gonna be out in more work. It's gonna be a burden upon the organization. You're gonna to have to do a calculation to say, how do I calculate that median charge? So it is different than a little bit of that information that you're gonna to have to publish as a 1-1 for the payment transparency that we went through earlier. And then you could ask lots of questions about contract settlements, value-based payments, other provisions in the contract. Do I or don't I include those? So lots of detail there as well. We have a little bit more time on this one, but it's gonna come around the corner quickly after we get the 1-1 one -one payment information posted. And as a reminder, critical access are exempt from this provision at the moment. So concluding on this payment transparency, you've seen the comments, you've seen the lawsuits, put a quote on here about AHA talking about legal challenges. I'm sure there's gonna be more to come on this, this section. The one-one information for the first section, those five items is something we need to continue with. That's been, that lawsuit has been overturned, so that's going forward. It could be under subject to future litigation, but at this point we need to go forward and we'll see what happens with the cost report items as we get to the final rule posted. So that concludes this section and we're gonna to go to our first polling question. All right, first polling question here. What date does the price and payment transparency, transparency program become effective? All right, looks like voting has stopped, so we're going to close this and here are the results. Sounds good. And January 1 is the correct date, so nope. for those that uh, chose differently, January 1, 2021 is the, is the correct answer. Okay. Sounds good. We will keep going forward. The last couple sections we've been talking about are very detailed sections in terms of uncompensated care and payments and the Medicare bad debt is gonna follow on that similar theme, unfortunately. And what we're talking about is in the proposed rule is Medicare really trying to put some of their longstanding policies into the rule. This is way one um, person kind of quoted what they're trying to do and they're really trying to go and talk about retroactively doing this and that's where I think that people um, 
have a lot of their concerns. So just as a little bit of background, Medicare has some general guidelines in terms of bad debts, and these are the four bullet points talk about some of those guidelines. You know, I talk about re using sound business judgment. I've read reasonable collection efforts and things like that. So these have been the guidelines that have been that have been out there in the regulations. Part of it that Medicare has you've been using these general guidelines also oftentimes has has more specific policies. So what these what they're trying to do now is say, okay, I've got these policies. This is what I'm enforcing when I go through bad debt audits and things. So let's get these into law and regulation and put some specifics out there. And the justification in their mind as to why I'm doing this retroactively is to say, okay, I'm leveling the paying field. Everybody knows what the regulations are. It's not here and the patient and was this patient a patient this year, but the bad debt next year and which rule applies and so forth. So hopefully they're to create a little clarity by doing that section. And as an example of what they're talking about in terms of getting some specifics into the rule, they would talk about the issuance of the bill and they use the term shortly after and they, and they put in the proposed rule would be at least within 120 days of either the Medicare remit or their secondary payer remit. So getting around very specific dates. Also the collection efforts, that they have, they have a 120 day collection effort that has to restart there. You take this extreme example and somebody owes a thousand bucks, pay you five, ten dollars every 120 days, does it restart then? Is it reasonable judgment say I'm not gonna collect that? Excuse me, they're getting more, much more into the specific side of things. So one, a couple other points to reminder is, and as we go forward with the bad debt, when we talk about accounting standard 606, so we're not gonna get into the accounting regulations, but you've heard probably heard the term implicit price concessions as we talked about bad debts. And really the second point about CMS proposing that they must be written off to a expense account for Medicare bad debts. And this is, there's an effective time for cost reports starting on or after October 1st, which is quickly approaching for anybody who's a 930 year end. So, really getting into specifics of which general ledger account do they put those bad debts to. Probably an easy thing to comply with, but one more detail we all have to watch. Ryan, I just want to add a little bit uh, onto okay. that. So from, from this aspect of it, uh, you know, it would seem to, to indicate on, on most hospital um, EHR systems when your revenue cycle team is writing off a Medicare bad debt. And so you've gone through the proper collection practices, um, et cetera, it's been returned from the collection agency, all that has to happen. And that's what they're codifying uh, in this too. But when the revenue cycle team is writing, finally done writing that account off, whether it be, and most specifically Medicare looks at these when they're taking them to a bad debt exp expense account versus contractual is the Medicaid crossovers. Um, a lot of times from some state Medicaid plans, they'll say this is a contractual um, amount because it's a no pay from them. And so the revenue cycle team is writing it off as a contractual. That's what the remit code will come back as, but truly it's not a contractual item. It's truly a bad debt because the patient hasn't paid. It's a secondary payer. They're not choosing to pay and it's truly a bad debt. Um, whereas, the revenue cycle team may be taking it as a contractual. We need to make sure that those are written off to a bad debt expense account and that the code that you're using in the, in the system in your EHR is writing them off to a, the bad debt expense account rather than a contractual. If Medicare sees that they're written off to a contractual, they will disallow that Medicare bad debt. All right, so not only just ensuring that's happening on your traditional bad debts, but also on crossovers, that is truly being done to a bad debt expense account, not a contractual account. Otherwise, Medicare will disallow those. So please check with your revenue cycle team and ensure that that's happening. And that's the um, reason code that they're using is not a contractual reason code uh, in the system. It's, it's a bad debt. Just a couple more slides on bad debt. We included these as kind of a reminder of what is not a Medicare bad debt. Just in keep in mind, I can claim my deductibles and co for hospital covered services, not 
would claim them for the first bullet, non-covered services or non-Medicare patients. Remember, I can't claim them for fee schedule, professional, physician payments as well. And a couple other items there, things written off to charity care, things written off to a control allowance account that we just talked about, those types of things. So you're going through your list, sure you're paying the diligence to make sure it's, a, it's the applicable items that I can include. So including here a quote from the AHA is really concerned about retroactively of this policy. It's, they're, it's really not warranted and that's really what they're pushing on in terms of the final rule to be changed. So we'll see how it happens when we get the final rule out and we can give some further clarification if it's different than this, but that's really what a lot of people have been pushing back on. So to wrap up our bad debt section, just as a key reminder, these are areas of focus for auditors. And if they find issues with their doing that, they can extrapolate that and then throw those out. So if they find you only wrote off 50% of them to a bad debt expense account versus contractual, they could in theory potentially throw out 50% of your entire listing. So making sure the listing is what, that we're submitting meets the current policies and those rules, I think that's the key point, um, whether it's put into law or it's modified, they, Medicare is really kind of enforcing a lot of these specifics as they're standing in their current policies. So we need to make sure we're in compliant with those policies as we're going forward. So lots of detail there as well. And Ryan, I just wanted to emphasize and, and give examples on, on the Medicare bad debt listings. You know, we all know you're getting paid for the Medicare bad debt 65% of what you're claiming. And so just recently, you know, to give you some examples of that, uh, I had a, a hospital um, where they sampled five um, line items that totaled $500 of Medicare bad debts. Two of the uh, items contained professional fees um, that were written off for Medicare bad debts. We um, should all remember again, as Ryan indicated, that professional fees um, are not included in Medicare bad debts and should not be included in Medicare bad debt listings. Um, and so that, I can't remember exactly what it was, but when extrapolated out on two of those five, uh, it ended up being that they were disallowing 70,000 of the Medicare bad debt listing. Uh, so we just, you know, be very mindful of your Medicare bad debt listings, make sure they're clean when we're submitting them, et cetera, because it could, when Medicare is doing their sample tests on these, could extrapolate to where they're disallowing quite a bit of it. Now they did... Um, that client did work through uh, along with us to get them to um, redo it and resample some pieces. So uh, it brought down the disallowance by quite a bit. But again, uh, let's just make sure that we have clean listings um, when we're submitting them for the cost report purpose. Sounds good. I think that's a good concluding point for bad debt. So I think we're up to our second polling question here. So it looks like we have 100% that said true. So I believe you are correct. Okay. Correct. Right. So Amy, I will be taking over now, so. Perfect, you have control. Thank you very much. So everybody, I'm gonna talk a little bit more, finishing up on the IPPS stuff and then uh, going into a few other topics, the OPPS proposed rule and, uh, um, whoops. Uh, some uh, RHC productivity standards and et cetera. So with that on the low volume, so the low volume hospital, this is a payment adjustment for um, PPS hospitals that have less than 3,800 total discharges. So this is a change that was made effective with the federal fiscal year 2019 and it's in effect through federal fiscal year 2022. So ending September 30th of 2022. So any uh, PPS hospital that is 15 miles away from another subsection D hospital, which what's subsection D? Well, that's a PPS hospital as defined by the regs. Um, and so if you are more than 15 miles away from another PPS hospital and you have less than 3,800 total discharges, all right, it used to be Medicare discharges that they went by prior to uh, 2019, but it's now 3,800 total discharges, you qualify for an additional payment, all right? And that 3,800 discharges is based on your most recently submitted cost report. And so, and looking at that, if you do qualify, you have to make a, a written 
uh, application into your Medicare administrative contractor, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, but your additional payment is essentially a, a sliding scale, and that sliding scale is on, based on a percentage, and if you have less than 500 discharges, uh, you'll get 25%, and then that sliding scale goes all the way up to zero if you have a hospital that has 3,800 or more discharges, all right? Um, and so, anywhere wherever your total discharges fall on your previously filed cost report uh, will fall in there at percentage and it's an add-on to your either your D or G payments or if you're a sole community hospital and your hospital specific is higher um, that's an add-on to that it does include capital payments also um, and so it's an add-on that you can can get for that and it's a really big deal for those hospitals that qualify for this um, we have a number of clients that uh, the payment is in excess of a million dollars um, for them, just for the low volume. So uh, if this program ever does end, I'm sure there's, well, when it's scheduled to end in 2022, there's probably some hard lobbying needs to be done to extend this program past that date too. So it, it is a lot of dollars. Again, it, you have to have a written application um, for this to your MAC, um, and it must be done by September 1. Um, that doesn't give a lot of time between now and uh, that date. Um, so hopefully if your facility qualifies for this, um, you have already done your written application in. If not, that would be something that needs to be done ASAP. Um, so that needs to be submitted to your MAC. It can be done by email. If you qualified for it in the past, you essentially just need to let them know that yes, based on my previously filed cost report, I'm still below the discharges and I'm still more than 15 miles away from the subsection D PPS hospital, and you can list that hospital. Um, most of uh, our clients and the ones that we assist with, we can email it into the MAX and uh, they'll accept that. The rates um, will be then effective 10 1, um, or your low volume application is then effective that uh, um, 10 1, which is the federal fiscal year start date. So again, each year it needs to be re-upped. Um, it's not a one-time thing. You need to re reapply for it every single year. If by chance a facility um, misses it by 9-1, um, you still can apply. It's just your start date is not 10-1. It is 30 days after the MAC gives you approval. They do have to look at it within a certain time period too. Um, but I would most likely say that if you don't get it in by September 1, your start date wouldn't be 10-1, it'll probably be November 1 if you got it sometime in, in September. So um, just a FYI on that. So it's not a hard fast. If you missed the 9-1, you won't get it. It's just how much of the federal fiscal year will you receive the payment for. Um, Another item here that sometimes we get a little bit confused is based on discharges um, that says low volume and discharges are really not low volume. That's the one I just talked about, but it's a volume decrease adjustment in discharges. Um, and so this is eligible for sole community hospitals and Medicare dependent hospitals only. All right, so if you're a PPS hospital and you have one of those qualifications, you could get extra reimbursement if you had a 5% drop in your discharges due to factors beyond the hospital's control. Well, guess what? We have a perfect rationale, um, COVID-19, if you did experience a drop in your inpatient discharges um, by more than 5% over your previous fiscal year uh, to qualify for this volume decreased adjustment and, and potentially an increase in reimbursement. You do have to file a request for the additional reimbursement after your Medicare cost report is filed. So let's just say you're a uh, September 30th year end uh, and you do realize that you had more than a 5% decline in discharges uh, for your fiscal year. Um, and so once your cost report is filed, you can submit it then. Uh, the deadline for submitting it is 180 days after the notice of program reimbursement. So there is quite a timeline in order for you to file this. Um, so let's just say the cost report isn't finalized for another two years. You have 180 days from that date in order to file, file this request. Um, so what is the, the potential opportunity for you here? If your 
uh, Medicare cost for your inpatients, um, fixed and a portion of variable exceeds your Medicare payments, then you would get some extra reimbursement. Again, you typically have to have a justification for the decrease in discharges that's beyond your control. As I mentioned, COVID is a uh, perfect opportunity for that. That would be your rationale. Um, Medicare's determination of that payment amount, uh, that fixed and variable, is currently under appeal um, and litigation. Uh, and so there's some, some litigation out there regarding it. Medicare changed that calculation here a couple of years ago. Um, but with that, one thing to always look at is, as well, if my Medicare uh, payments on the inpatient side exceed my cost already on the cost report without taking out any variable costs, you're probably not going to receive any additional reimbursement. So that's one thing to just to look at. But, you know, please be mindful of this. Analyze it, analyze it as part of your cost report preparation um, and put it on your radar. Um, you know, for the future in that if you did have that 5% decline, well then let's look at it uh, and see if you potentially qualify and, and making that request. So just uh, from the IPPS side, um, some quickly approaching deadlines for the low volume, the geographic reclass, you know, make sure that we get those in, um, you know, on the proposed rule, which I fully expect the final rule and I sure wish we were talking about that. And, um, today too, but uh, um, to what was in there, but an average payment increase of about 1.6%. Um, you know, please be mindful of, of the effort needed to comply with the price and payment transparency items coming up 1-1 of 2021. Uh, a lot of work there. Uh, again, the S10 audits, um, Medicare has been pretty um, active with those. Um, this year, uh, we've probably seen uh, the number of audits on, on PPS hospitals go up by fivefold um, from January 1 of 2020 through now. And then also Medicare bad debts, making sure that we're getting uh, uh, with the, rev not, I'm not going to say revised, but with the clarified information coming out, making sure that our bad debt listings uh, include all the appropriate information uh, and be mindful of the regulations there to make sure that we're claiming allowable Medicare bed debts. Moving on to the OPPS proposed rule, just have a few things on this. Uh, some payment changes. On average, uh, Medicare is indicating uh, an increase of about 2.6%, uh, urban at about 2.5%, and rural facilities at about 3.2%, broken down further into sole community and other so sole communities about 35 and the other rural is about 2.5%. 7%. So that'll be the, about the average increases in, in outpatient payments. Um, could be or would be additional increases for those uh, similarly to the inpatient side, those with a low wage index on the rural hospitals would have a, a bump up uh, in theirs for having a lower wage index uh, due to uh, uh, the bump up to the 25th percentile on their wage index. Um, some other things in the OPPS side, um, Medicare is looking at eliminating the inpatient only list over three years. Um, so they're recommending phasing in starting in 2021. So the OPPS rules is on a calendar year. Um, and so this is always um, confusing when I have to explain it to everybody. The inpatient rule is on a federal fiscal year, which is October to the end of September. The OPPS rule is on a calendar year. So Medicare is looking at from the OPPS side, um, eliminating the inpatient only list uh, over three years. So starting January 1 of 2021, they're looking about removing about 300 musculoskeletal services, such as certain joint replacement procedures and remo removing them from the inpatient only list um, and thereby could be done on an outpatient uh, basis in a hospital uh, and even potentially in ASC uh, at some point in time. So. Um, you know, something to be mindful of and, and um, those items that may, may, may be removed and could be done in a different location than what was done before. Um, ASCs uh, perform 11 more procedures, includes hip arthroplasty. Um, so that will be on there. And then additional proposals to review ASC procedures that would be allowed in an ASC uh, could add about 270 more to that listing than what's there. 
currently. Uh, essentially, Medicare's discussion on this is, is really freedom of choice and allowing the physicians and the practitioners to be practice medicine and be mindful of the most um, um, safe location for doing these procedures. And if they feel that an outpatient basis uh, is a safe place to do a, a previous inpatient only, well then that's the physician's determination and the physician can make the best call on that rather than CMS dictating that through payment um, regulations. Uh, another item here is just uh, talking about on the OPPS side is 340B reductions. Um, they, as you may well know, drugs purchased uh, through the hospital for outpatients uh, that qualifying for 340B acquired drugs is currently ASP minus 22%. 22.5%. Um, Medicare, through the surveys that uh, uh, hospitals submitted in the last couple of years, uh, the surveys came back and in indicating that uh, it, the discount was much higher than the 22.5%. And so Medicare is proposing to take those drugs acquired um, through 340B to now ASP minus 28%, 28.7%, excuse me. So additional reduc uh, reduction on those drugs. Um, the Providers or hospitals that are exempt for those are rural soul community hospitals, PPS exempt cancer hospitals and children's hospitals. Um, all would not see that decrease applicable to them, um, but all other PPS hospitals that acquired 340B drugs would see that increased reduction. Uh, again, this is a proposed rule, not final. Uh, the comment period is open till October 5th for the OPPS rules. So if there's anything that uh, there that you don't like, feel free to make comments to CMS um, on that um, to propose something different than what they're doing, such as keeping the 22 and a half percent, even though we're, we don't like that one. Um, it's better than 28.7. Amy, our next polling question. All right, here, polling question number three, true or false? Hospitals must make a written request for low volume status. Everyone's voting pretty quickly, so looks like everyone has said 100%, so good job. Good, thank you. Um, another item that I uh, just wanted to talk about from the outpatient side is uh, the uh, offsite provider-based clinics. Hi. Uh, what Medicare has indicated site neutral payments and essentially trying to get uh, the payments um, similar to what they would pay under the Medicare physician fee schedule for provider-based clinics. So we all um, probably know over the years, CMS is not a fan of the differential on that uh, payment that provider-based clinics get. Um, if you've read the regs, that becomes fairly evident. Um, but did want to talk about what um, some recent developments in July here. So Medicare did indicate um, back with the 29, 2019, not 29, 2019 OPPS rule uh, where they, for all offsite provider-based clinics, reduced the payment on the clinic office visit, um, which is HCPCS code G0463. Um, they reduced it down. It was a two-year phase in in 2019 and 2020, where they're, the first year they're going to reduce the payment down 30%, and then the second year down another 30%, so a 60% reduction down to 40% payment for off-site provider-based clinics, for all off-site provider-based clinics. And that is um, the 60% or the 40% payment um, is what they had indicated for those that were not meeting um, uh, we're not uh, how the grandfathering rules uh, when they switched in in uh, November second of 2015 that uh, it e essentially e uh, equates to what a freestanding clinic would would receive for payment was about that 40 percent of the APC. So that was their rationale in the t in the uh, two year phase in. Well, um, in 2019, Medicare went ahead with that reduction. Um, it was filed a lawsuit. Um, uh, a, I'm not sure a district court or whatever had indicated ruled in favor of the providers. And so Medicare uh, had reinstated and had went back and repaid all those payments in 2019 to the providers 
um, to give them the full payment for the G0463 in 2019. However, in July, the Court of Appeals, because uh, Medicare had appealed it, the Court of Appeals reinstated in favor of CMS. Um, and so now that is where it stands. There's probably a little bit of appeal options available, but limited. Um, so not quite sure where this was gonna end up, but here's our, our issue. In 2019, Medicare did take that 30% reduction. Now they paid it back by reprocessing all the claims. Now an appeals court said, nope, we side with CMS from the get-go. The reduction could have occurred. So is there a liability that you have that Medicare may come back and recoup that 30% reduction for the offsite clinics in 2019? I would say that that's highly likely um, that that could be the case. And so do you have a liability um, that you have out there that uh, Medicare could come back and recoup those funds for that offsite um, provider-based clinic visit, that APC and that 30% reduction? So something to think about that. Um, the 2020 Medicare went ahead, even though um, at first they lost on the 2019, they went ahead with the reduction in the 2020. So they did pay that G0463 at the lower rate in 2020. Again, that's being challenged, um, but that reduction is, is there. And so probably unless something else changes uh, and more fights ahead, that reduction will stay. We don't have a claims mess going on with the 2020 uh, calendar year as much as we do in, in 2019. 2021, current course likely to continue there with the 40% uh, with that code being paid at the 40% for the offsite provider-based clinics. Um, some items that we wanted to bring up, not necessarily PPS hospitals here, so it'd be PPS and critical access if your health system it has critical access too, but you all have, or not you all have rural health clinics, but quite a few of you may have rural health clinics. Um, and so with that, we want to talk about the productivity standard. Um, if you have an RHC, um, the RHC is subject to minimum visit amounts. So for one FTE of a physician, they must do 4,200 visits. And for a mid-level, they do 2,100 visits. Well, due to COVID and the public health emergency that was issued, it really disrupted clinic staffing and volumes. Patients weren't coming into the clinics uh, like they were um, really advised to, to stay home. Um, and then subsequently, uh, CMS allowed rural health clinics to do telehealth visits. Telehealth visits are not RHC face-to-face -face visits. Um, that's a whole nother item that we could talk about here and carving out telehealth time out of your RHC. Um, again, any time that a practitioner is doing a telehealth visit under the public health emergency for an RHC, it is not part of their FTE towards the productivity standard, all right? Um, but again, if by chance on the FTEs, when you're counting up the FTEs for a year in which this public health emergency is and you're reporting on, Medicare has said that you can uh, qualify for an exception to the productivity standard. And COVID-19 uh, is one of those. Um, and so what they're indicating is, is that, um, you know, and in, in to apply for an exception to the productivity standard. So if your if your visits are less than the productivity standard is calculated on the cost report, you can apply for an exception to your MAC. Um, you would first need to calculate um, what your current FTEs are and what your current visits are to determine how much you're impacted by the productivity standard. You would write to the MAC calculating that percent reduction or including that percent reduction you would need to eliminate any uh, reduction in reimbursement. So let's just say your actual visits were 5,000 visits, uh, RHC visits, the productivity standard was 6,000 visits. We'd want to request a percentage reduction in the productivity standard so that we did reduce the productivity standard below our actual visits. Um, we have <clears throat> worked with one client that already requested that was a 630 year end. Uh, they requested only a 20% reduction 
Um, in the productivity standard, the MAC wrote back with approval, except for the approval was for a full reduction in the productivity standard. So essentially for every one FTE of a practitioner, all they had to do was one RHC visit. Um, that was very generous by the MAC. I don't know if we're gonna see every MAC do that, um, but that's what we saw with one of them. Um, so again, this needs to be requested. It's not a blanket exception. Um, so that needs to be filled out. And we do recommend completing that and submitting it to your MAC at least 60 days prior to filing your cost report. What we're trying to do is get approval before you file your cost report so that you can include that exception reduction on your filed cost report and thereby getting the reimbursement um, right away rather than waiting until after you submitted, you submitted your cost report and getting it upon the finalized cost report. And last but not least, what we wanted to talk about is just some CARES Act uh, funds. We um, didn't have a lot on this because we didn't have, uh, when we put the slide deck together, um, didn't have a lot of clarity. Um, and so what that would impact and how it might impact cost report funds as a P or the cost report. And if you're a PPS hospital and don't have any cost-based units, um, probably wouldn't impact your facility much at all. Um, but if you did have any cost-based departments or if you were a rural demo facility or some of uh, you on the phone may have uh, critical access hospitals in your system, um, would any of the funds, both provider relief funds or payroll protection funds, if they receive them, be offset on the Medicare cost report? Um, one of the MACs came out there in early July, I'm say late June, early July came out and indicated that they were going to offset the PPP funds. Um, shortly after, there was a flurry of, led, of letters by congressmen and women back to uh, CMS Administrator Verma. Uh, and not long after that, I think within a week, she did tweet out, um, that seems to be the new way to, to publish uh, um, guidance, but uh, I find it interesting is that uh, CMS does not intend for PPP funds to impact Medicare payments to, to rural hospitals. Um, more guidance will be out soon explaining how they should report those funds on the cost report. Well, I'm not sure if the guidance was what they put out yesterday, or excuse me, Wednesday evening on the 26th, but uh, on CMS's website under the COVID, there is a FAQ and it's uh, about 120 some pages now of an FAQ regarding everything um, of the changes that they've done under COVID. And there's a cost reporting section that specifically addresses uh, impacting Medicare payments on the cost report due to both the payroll protection program and the HHS uh, care funds or the provider release funds. Um, again, short notice, we're still looking at that, but in summary, what we've seen from the few FAQs is that no, they do not, um, will not offset these funds on the Medicare cost report, um, but there's some qualifiers in there specific to the provider relief funds um, to make sure that we're not double dipping, um, meaning if you received payment from some other source for these funds, um, can you claim those funds under the provider relief fund, uh, provider relief act also in those funds. So. In a nutshell, what that means is, is if I had $100,000 of uh, personal protective equipment that we bought that we were gonna claim under the provider relief funds, but we also included that on the cost report, does that mean that, hey, if the cost report paid me $30,000 um, for that $100,000 of expense item that I only get to claim 70,000 on under the provider relief act funds? Uh, again, not sure. Um, but it does have that qualifier in their Q and A um, there that the you know need to be mindful that the funds were not reimbursed under some other source. So that is what we have again on the provider relief funds. Um, just uh, uh, I know we had a webinar the other day. Um, the firm did, but be mindful of the reporting timelines there. Um, the instructions, the template were to be released, have not yet, to my understanding. Uh, on August 17th, um, the reporting system is still scheduled to be available October 1, um, and initial reports are due February 15th of 2021, with final reporting due by July 31st 
of 2021. So essentially indicating that uh, um, the money needs to be spent by that day, um, July 31st of 2021 from your provider relief funds. I know they're still just distributing funds. If you have nursing homes in your, uh, in your system, there was additional funds that went out yesterday to nursing facilities. Um, and so um, I believe, yeah, it was yesterday morning. So again, so more money from the CARES Act going out. Again, all of these funds are subject to review and audit by the applicable agencies. So, um, you know, be mindful of the reporting mechanisms here. With that, um, I think this last polling question, potentially, Amy. It is the yeah. last polling question here. It is another true or false. Money needs to be spent by July 31st, 2021. And we have 91% that said true. It is true. So with that, just in conclusion, um, you know, some small pay, payment increases, please be mindful of the filing deadlines um, that are out there and making sure that you're, you're getting all the reimbursement that's, um, you know, coming due to you, but uh, we need to be mindful of making sure we're applying for those special increases that we can get. Um, you know, potential increase in reporting requirements, um, both on the cost report and outside of it on the website. And as always, um, Medicare's rules and regulations are changing um, for what, for me, what seems like on a daily basis lately. Uh, and so, you know, keep on top of it and ask questions um, and feel free to reach out to us to, to ask those questions. With that, um, We'd be happy to answer any of the questions that you may have, so. All right, looks like we have attendees dropping off. So we will say thank you so much for attending and thank you to our presenters. And if you do need to contact um, Brian or Ryan, here's our contact information. And we hope everyone has a great day. Thank Thanks. you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm.